What's up, everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi. I'm a board-certified psychiatrist, bringing you the most up-to-date mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to my community, I would love to make you a subscriber. Come back for the new videos. And if you're a returning viewer, I appreciate your support so much. Thank you. So with that said, I'm going to talk a little bit about a topic everyone's asked me about it at one point or another during this process. So I get tons of questions about the risks and side effects associated with antipsychotic medications. And rightfully so. These meds have a lot of side effects. We know that. And that's one of the things I, as a physician, worry about all the time when prescribing them. Now, these medications are no longer used exclusively for schizophrenia. They're now widely accepted as treatment for bipolar disorder, as adjunctive treatment for major depression, and even for severe anxiety disorders treat resistant to other treatments or medications. As a result, tons of people are on these medications now. There was a company called Cerebral recently that was cited as giving these medications out like candy. So I don't ever advise that. They are not candy and they're not very tasty. With that said though, people are obviously concerned about the risks associated with these medications. And the one that I get asked about all the time is, Dr. Rossi, what is the most feared side effect of antipsychotic medications? The one that everybody is concerned about. And that's what this video is about. So we're gonna go ahead and crack right into it. So if you wanna know what that feared side effect is, stay tuned. So if you guys haven't guessed what the most feared side effect associated with antipsychotic medications is, I'm going to tell you right now, it's tardive dyskinesia, TD. It's the worst thing to have. Um, it's not ED, right? It's TD. So tardive dyskinesia is a problem, right? And this is an irreversible movement disorder. And in this discussion, we're gonna talk about the pathophysiology behind it, why it develops, and some of the misconceptions about how many people actually develop TD on medication. I'm gonna provide you that research and that data here. So in the industry, we call these side effects associated with dopamine blocking medications EPS. We call them EPS, extrapyramidal syndromes or extrapyramidal symptoms, depending on who you talk to. And there's various forms of EPS. And we know that dopamine blockade can cause a variety of these movement disorders, right? After all, dopamine is directly involved in the process of movement. And we call these things, like I said, EPS, extrapyramidal syndromes, e extrapyramidal symptoms, whatever you wanna call it, but basically extrapyramidal syndromes or EPS for short. Now, most of these EPS disorders, right, or side effects are going to develop shortly after starting the medication. So somebody's going to take the medication and they're going to rapidly develop a dystonic reaction like torticollis. And that's a situation where your neck is kind of kinked and you really just can't stop keeping your neck in this position, right? So we have medications that usually acutely treat these things and they're not that big of a deal to fix and obviously stopping the offending agent is one of the main treatments. Now, that's not the case in tardive dyskinesia. There's actually a delay in the symptoms and you can see it in the name, tardive stands for tardy, right, or delay. And the, and the symptoms will persist even after people stop the medication. And that's the problem with this type of EPS syndrome. Now, Tardive can develop when the medication is used for a few months or as little as a few weeks in the case of, say, elderly patients who are more susceptible to the development of TD. TD can also occur when the medication is discontinued or reduced. So we have a problem, we don't know, is it when you start the medication, is it when you reduce the medication, who knows? That's what we're here to kind of figure out, right? So the presence of things like acute dystonic reactions, right? I said like a dystonia, that unfortunately, contrary to popular belief, does not increase your risk for TD. This is a myth. People talk about this all the time, say like, well, if you've had EPS before, you're going to develop tardive dyskinesia, not true, doesn't correlate, right? So it's a misconception commonly talked about even within the psychiatry community, but does not, but is not a fact, right? The risk of most EPS is obviously dose related. So if you were to increase the dose really, really high, the likelihood of, a, of somebody having a dystonic reaction is gonna be much greater. So the next part of this video, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the myths associated with tardive dyskinesia and why they're not correct. So although tardive dyskinesia might be the most feared side effect for my patients, 
It's actually not the most problematic one, and it's not the one that I actually think demands the most attention. The one that, in my mind, I'm always thinking about is akathisia, and this is going to be the topic of a future video. So, we were saying we're going to talk about these myths associated with TD, and I already said one of them. One of them is that if you develop a dystonic reaction, you're more likely to develop TD. Again, not true. Here's another one that's really interesting. This is probably the most important one for you guys to take home. The longer you stay on the antipsychotic medication, the more likely you are to develop tardive dyskinesia. Now that's what's taught to us, even as residents, that's kind of what's in the public knowledge about tardive dyskinesia, is that the longer you stay on the medication, the more at risk you are. Somebody will say like, don't keep this woman on the medication too long, she's gonna develop TD, right? The reality is that's simply not true, right? And that's because people don't understand the difference between prevalence, right, and incidence. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about this in a second, but the reality of the situation is that the prevalence of tardive dyskinesia increases with time, but the incidence or number of new cases actually decreases with time. So I'm gonna explain more about that in a second. The other one is with first generation dopamine blockers, 40 to 50% of patients develop TD, but not in a linear fashion. That's the other piece that people misunderstand. Now that's a substantial portion of people, and when we're talking first generation dopamine blockers, we're talking about things like haloperidol. Half of the patients are going to develop TD within the first five years of taking the medication. So within the first five years of taking the medication, half of the patients are going to develop, who are going to develop TD are going to develop it, right? So the incidence, when you break it down, is about 5% per, per year over the first five years, and then the incidence decreases to 1% to 2% per year and levels off after that. So that critical period over the first five years of taking dopamine-blocking medications is the time to really watch out for the development of tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is more likely to occur in the first few years of treatment and less likely to occur five, after five years of treatment. So that's in, probably the most critical point is that you really need to be mindful of this early on in treatment. Uh, if somebody's been on a medication for 20 years and hasn't developed tardive dyskinesia, the likelihood of them developing it is much lower than that first five year period when they started the med. The risk of TD also does not increase, like I said, with acute EPS. So if someone develops a dystonic reaction, it does not make it more likely that somebody's going to develop TD. There are three big risk factors that I want you to remember for tardive dyskinesia. And these are important because each one of them kind of matters, right? First and foremost, the diagnosis of schizophrenia alone puts you at risk for tardive dyskinesia. And I'm going to explain that in a second what I mean by that. The second one is older age. So I said that people who are elderly starting an antipsychotic for the first time, which you commonly see if somebody has a dementia with behavioral problems or somebody is delirious, older age puts you at higher risk. The third one is female sex. Females are more likely to develop TD than males. Not to say that it can't occur in a male patient. Now, Schizophrenia itself causes TD. That was kind of a strange statement that I made and, and very interesting, right? Because you wouldn't think that this is the case. But schizophrenia itself actually causes TD and it's been described in the literature far before, far way before medications were ever a thing in psychiatry for the treatment of schizophrenia, right? So even before medications were a thing, there was descriptions of people developing movement disorders similar to tardive dyskinesia just be with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. The prevalence, of course, was much lower. So I said that with haloperidol and those first generation medications, about 40 to 50% of people would develop tardive dyskinesia. With, with the disease process alone, it's much lower, probably about 5 to 10% is the best estimate that we have of how many people would develop it without any treatment. This occurs because Schizophrenia is not just a disease of the cortex, right? It also involves the basal ganglia. And it's a disease of dopamine receptors and dopamine production to begin with. So 
so because it's not just a disease of the cortex, it also involves the basal ganglia, which is responsible for movement disorders. Obviously, over a long enough timeline with no treatment, schizophrenia, patients with schizophrenia can develop various types of movement disorders. So you might be saying now at this point, well, we talked about first generation medications like haloperidol causing a lot of tardive dyskinesia over a lifetime, something like 40 to 50% of patients will develop it. What about the newer medications, the second generation antipsychotics like risperdone or lanzapine, etc.? Well, we're in luck because there's two randomized controlled trials that looked at tardive risk at one year of treatment. And what they found was that risperdol had about a 0.6% chance of TD at one year, or lanzapine, another common medication prescribed for schizophrenia, had a tardive dyskinesia risk at one year of 0.5%, so half a percent. And they also looked at haloperidol for comparison, and what they found was with haloperidol at one year, it's about 2.7% to 4.5%, which is what we said at the beginning of this video when I said the risk of developing tardive over the first five years is about 5% if you're on a first generation medication. So it's clear from this data a couple of things. Number one, first generation dopamine blockers like haloperidol are much more risky in terms of the development of tardive dyskinesia compared to second generation medications. And if we look at those percentages, right, this 0.5% or 0.6% with risperdal, this rate is actually very similar to placebo. And what I mean by that is if somebody did not receive any treatment for schizophrenia and they just allowed the natural disease process to continue on, about 0.5% or 0.6% of those patients would develop a movement disorder similar to TD anyway as a result of the schizophrenia disease process itself because I said it involves the basal ganglia. So essentially the same as placebo, much, much lower risk. And then you might be asking about patients with mood illness, right? So those who are on antipsychotics for depression or bipolar disorder. What we see there is that patients with mood illnesses who use do dopamine blocking medications actually have very low rates of TD or else we'd be hearing a lot more about it, right? We don't hear that much about it, even though I said these medications are being prescribed more readily than ever in the history of psychiatric treatment. So much lower risk of developing TD when you're using dopamine blockers for mood illness. It can occur, obviously, in mood disorders, just like it can in schizophrenia, but again, much lower risk. And it's so infrequent that even publishing things like case reports on this are, are, are a good idea. So it's not nearly the same rate as those with schizophrenia. In mood disorders, it's essentially a fraction of a percent. Now, the risk of TD is associated with the underlying pathology of schizophrenia. Like I said, schizophrenia's pathology involves dopamine to begin with, so obviously disorders that are going to affect the dopamine pathways are ultimately going to affect movement as well. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this video talking a little bit about treatment for tardive dyskinesia, and you might not even be aware of this at this point, but believe it or not, there's been two FDA-approved medications for tardive dyskinesia. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how they work and what they do. So for a long time, we had absolutely no treatment for TD. Unfortunately, people were stuck dealing with it. There was no way to treat it at all. There was nothing that benefited or helped in any way. In the last few years, two medications have been developed. One is called valbenazine or Ingreza, and the other is called dutetrabenazine. And these are derivatives of tetrabenazine, which was a medication used in Huntington's disease. Both are FDA approved for the treatment of tardive dyskinesia. Now the mechanism of action of valbenazine and dutetrabenazine is a VMAT2 inhibitor, right? So these are vesicles located, these are vesicular monoamine transporter 2 inhibition, which is going to result in decreased release of monoamine activity at the synapse. So these are vesicles that are located in the presynaptic terminal that get released into the synapse. And if you inhibit these, you're going to have a decrease in monoamine activity at the synapse, resulting in improved symptoms for tardive dyskinesia. Now, the studies used to gain the FDA approval for these medications showed a mild improvement on the abnormal involuntary movement scale. So that's also known as the AIMS scale, a very common scale administered in outpatient and inpatient psychiatry. 
And they did see a statistically significant improvement of two to three points in patients with mild TD. It's important to keep in mind that TD did not go away fully with these medications. It was just a treatment to support the symptoms, not necessarily to cure the person of the disorder. So keeping in mind that this doesn't fully remove all of the TD symptoms, it just makes it significantly better for the patient. Obviously the best treatment for somebody who develops TD is to immediately stop the dopamine blocking medication. So if you notice abnormal involuntary movements of the mouth or face, you're going to want to stop that medication as soon as possible because in some cases, if the dopamine blocker is stopped early enough, TD is reversible. Some people do have reversal of symptoms. So it's not necessarily a guarantee that you will go on to develop TD for the rest of your life if you catch it early enough. But there's always that risk too. In many cases, the medications are continued anyway because the patient doesn't have any other option and the schizophrenia is severe enough that it causes significant impairment in function in their daily life. So they have to take the medication anyway, despite TD. So at that point, we are left with treating these patients with these VMAT2 inhibitors like valbenazine or dutetrabenazine. I'm going to hold the video there, guys. I would love to take your questions on this. Hopefully this was valuable for you. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. It really helps me to keep going, to keep myself motivated to make, it, to make these videos for you. Thanks again.